Welcome to Health Oddity, the show that strips away the jargon and hype surrounding all things health and fitness to help you live a long, strong and energetic life. Lining up at the bar this week, here's Peter Lant, Paul Bassett and James St. Pierre. Hello and welcome to the Health Oddity podcast, episode 117. We are continuing our run of fantastic guests in 2022 this week with someone who I will introduce you to uh, shortly. But first of all, we will uh, go around and meet the uh, the usual hosts uh, of the podcast and see how they're getting on. Uh, Mr. Paul Bassett, how are you doing? You've had an interesting weekend uh, just gone. Yeah, yeah. I've, um, everyone hear me okay? I always get paranoid. I know we're having complaints about my internet connection. So, uh, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it was good. Yeah, I took my uh, seven-year-old up to a uh, kettlebell sport event where I did, well, I attempted to do the biathlon. Uh, it went, it actually came out pretty positive. I was quite happy, even though I didn't manage to do, uh, continue with the snatch. Uh, about a minute and a half into the snatch, I had a hand problem, uh, which, which hadn't really plagued me during the run-up. Um, but you know, competition environment uh, became an issue quite quickly. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I enjoyed it. It was good. It was good. It was good to to kind of get out there and road test some of the stuff I've been doing in in my own time in complete isolation with no one telling me whether or not it it would actually work really. So um, you know, it was good. Yeah, I, I enjoyed myself, and I've just got a week off now, which is good. Uh, I'm quite so a week off of all training this week is it just uh yeah, yeah. i just did some mobility and just took it easy and uh, actually feels weird not doing anything um but you know the training is often harder than the event so actually i didn't feel too tired from doing the event um because usually after training you go straight into some strength work or whatever or you do some conditioning so um but um yeah no it was good it was good you know and the lead up was good i you know no, no complaints um I, I can't make any excuses really there was a couple of mistakes that i made you know just because i'm not used to being in competition um and i think um you know in hindsight you know i could have done something slightly different in the snatch i could have swapped my hands much earlier and finished the whole thing on my left hand but you know you make well, these your mistakes first, your when you're first not thinking exper- your first competitive experience isn't it so you you take probably loads yeah. from that and you'll and you'll you'll learn from it and improve next time which is what it's all about isn't it well, I thought the jerk was going to be, I mean, I, I, I was struggling a bit with the jerk in, in my training for whatever reason, just because I mean, you're always kind of slightly tired when you go in. And then the idea of doing an eight minute set, like on a Wednesday after doing four hours of training people is never, you know, it's never, it makes you think, yeah, brilliant. I'm doing eight minutes. But, um, you know, with a week's rest and everything, it went all right. You know? mm. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, it's Peter Lant. How are you doing today? Um, I'm doing all right. It's just that's just resonated quite quite a lot with me actually because my training program at the minute is really heavy. I'm on proper mm. heavy pistols and my legs yeah. are smashed. Yeah. They're just smashed. <laughs> I haven't yeah. had that like feeling for a very long time. And it's yeah. I'm it's just I'm knack- I can't stop eating. Especially at the minute, my whole house smells of bone broth at the minute because I've just had a pot of that like on going for the last like couple of days and it smells lush. And the dog loves that it. Posh but, um, Sorry, posh bister, posh bister, yeah, 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 yeah. But no, um, and I've just I, I sent a message to Paul saying, I, like, I thought I had a parasite or something because I just can't stop eating because it's just like it's one of those things, right? Like, it'll cycle back down in a bit, but yeah, I'm tired at the minute because it's just so heavy. <laughs> I think it's what we spoke about last week, wasn't it? Where you know, naturally, if you're training volume or the training intensity or the, the weights you're using goes up a lot, you just tend to eat more and then when the when the training gets easier you you, you eat a bit less yeah so, totally yeah. and it, like yeah. i say at the minute i just can't stop i just honestly i'm i'm eating all day every day <laughs> well that's why i, I had to lose actually... eight kilos i had to eat <laughs> lose eight kilos because before like back in august i was just eat because i was training so much i was just eating all the time and i was just yeah. hungry i was eating too much you know that's why i had eight kilos to lose but but you kind of want to don't you your body's just like just give me some food so so that's a little um you know for any listeners who want to lose weight or anything it's dead easy you just do massive volume of pistol squats with a 40 kilo bell and then eat as much as you like <laughs> there you go <laughs> anyway see you later. 
pistols anyway. and pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Before we introduce our guests, I just have a very quick couple of well dones uh, for, well, a general well done. We hosted the Tactical Strength Challenge at the weekend at Unique Results. We had a really good, um, we had uh, a lot of members from Base Gym turn up uh, with Gareth, Gareth Doody and Mark Hassel. Uh, they were great guys. Mark, uh, uh, Gareth actually afterwards had a good chat with him. He says he always listens to our podcast when he's doing his um, cardio, I think, each week. And he really enjoys the podcast. Um, and we'll, we'll get Gareth on um, at some stage in the future. Well done to everyone for Tactical Strength Challenge. And Edith, who is a friend of the show uh, and unique results legend, Edith, 63 years old, uh, got her 105 kilo deadlift PB um, and 123 snatches in five minutes with the with the 12. So she was great. So give Edith a little shout out and everyone else who, uh, who did uh, the Tactical Strength Challenge at Unique Results. Anyway, now we have a fantastic guest and she's been sat there very patiently while we've been chatting. Um, so it is Vicky Corsa from realstrongwomen.co.uk. Um, and we will have a bit of a chat with Vicky and find out everything that she uh, does uh, with her business, with um, her online programming, with her studio, with her workshops. Um, but first of all, we will, uh, we will get to know Vicky Hello, Vicky. Hello. Thank you for having me. <laughs> OK. Um, yeah. And um, Vicky, someone I've been aware of for a long time uh, uh, in the health and fitness industry. I've known um, of Vicky and I know Vicky's uh, husband, Ben, as well, uh, through numerous courses in the past and things and also through a mutual kind of friend stroke coach. I think Chet, uh, mm -hmm. Chet Majaria, a friend of the show who's been uh, on, the, on the show before. Um, so it's really great to, to, to finally get Vicky on the podcast. Um, Vicky, do you want to tell uh, us and the listeners a little bit about yourself, about your background, about um, how you, how and when you moved into the health and fitness industry and then, you know, created, you know, real strong women and, uh, and just a little bit about that. And we can kind of dip in and out and ask questions yeah, as sure. we go, if that's OK. Yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, um, I started Real Strong Women, it must be five years ago now. I'm actually a probation officer by trade. That was what I did for my whole life um, since I was 20. And then I had my children. I was always into training and obviously I was married to Ben, who was a personal trainer at the time. Now it was obviously slightly um, changed his career into more uh sports therapy but I've sort of always lived with someone who's always exercised and I was never a sporty person at school but then um, I got into movement and it really really supported um, just everything in my life really I always felt better for, for exercising but you know like when you first started exercising I never really had a clue what I was doing and just bumbled along but then I found CrossFit I was a huge I was part of the CrossFit cult and um, but then I had my children and I had like uh, quite a significant birth trauma and um, had some injuries from birth. And then no one really knew what to do with me. And I kind of just entered this whole world where I didn't really belong anywhere anymore. I went to CrossFit and no fault of them, but they didn't know. They kind of just went, oh, we'll just do what feels OK. And I had no idea what actually what felt OK anymore. So I discovered this sort of whole new world of actually um, rehabbing somebody after they've they've given birth. Um, and started working with post I, I retrained when I was on maternity leave with my son which is a really crazy idea and um, then started doing some specialist training in pelvic health and just sort of learned to rehab myself at the same time as starting to work with other women and that's kind of how it started so my basically my kids broke my body and then I made a business out of it okay and on the <laughs> website you do you talk quite um quite quite openly and quite graphically mm. about you know what happened you know to you through 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 birth and and then the kind of um the, the thoughts you had and, and and the issues you had after that mm -hmm. and um I think what's why I really wanted to get you on the podcast is lots of our uh listeners are are women you know obviously mm. and the way that I kind of see um that that the, you sort of specialize in in training women obviously mm. but, but it, for me I it seems that you all you're cake you're taking it through different phases of of a woman's life as well as they kind of you know like you like you mentioned when, when women are young and then and then you know sort of prenatal and postnatal and then you mentioned kind of 
uh, you know, perimenopausal as well, yeah. and kind of as you move through. So there's really a whole a whole life cycle there, isn't there, yeah. of, of different, um, I suppose, considerations and different yeah. kind of different education that's required, and maybe twi- it's, it's not saying that that people can't exercise through all stages of life, but there's going to be different considerations and maybe different slight adjustments and things that you're going to need to make. Is that, is that right? Definitely. And I think when I first started out, I was a postnatal mum. So I tended to work with postnatal mums. And then I re- then sort of as my business developed, I realised that actually there's so many different challenges, especially, I mean, not that there aren't any for men, but for women, there's some quite unique challenges throughout a lifetime. And I, I was writing some material for um, a gym that I delivered training to yesterday. And we were talking about the challenges through a woman's lifetime in relation to exercise. But actually, it really is like an opportunity. And we were trying to like reframe it. If you Google, you know, birth trauma or hysterectomy or menopause, it's all quite negative stuff. And actually, we've got a huge opportunity at these key points in our life to really reassess, like, what's what does exercise do for us? What purpose does it serve? How should we be doing it? And so I think, you know, we we're really unique beings and traditionally, you know, gym programs has been, have been written with a with a man in mind and kind of women are seen as a smaller version of that. But actually, we're quite unique and we're quite different. So it actually, it's been fantastic to learn more about my body as a woman and stuff I wish that we'd been taught at school, you know, like about your menstrual cycle and how powerful you can really be at certain times. And actually, when you start transitioning into perimenopause and beyond, like what's actually happening in your body and what does that mean for your training? So it's actually really fascinating. And there's so much that, you know, you could go into so many rabbit holes on it. So sometimes I have to really pull myself back because you know we can't all be experts in all things um but yeah so I sort of sort of start always my specialism really starts with pelvic health but actually pelvic health is something that's impacted by all of those key times in a woman's life and then yeah then we are really thinking about those considerations about how to train because it's so important it's like it really is especially for menopause and beyond you know training exercise is a non-negotiable if we want to live a long and healthy life so yeah that's that's re- that's interesting though because obviously yeah there's these stages in life mm. and people think when do I stop training yeah. and it's like you don't do you there's no. always something you can do and, it, and and I have this a lot when people go oh, I've got older things are starting to hurt so I need to I need to stop it's like no you just need to maybe step back a bit yeah. Um, and then you can gain back strength and then, you know, still get back, not get back to where you were necessarily if you're getting older, but you can, as we've said before, slow down the aging process. Yeah. Um, but I think um, speaking about menopause, we had Helen Hall on ages yeah. ago and she was talking about it. And it was kind of like one of those things with like low mood and, and all of mm-hmm. that. And then like, you know, you go and see the doctor and they think you're depressed or they want to give you antidepressants. And it's like, well, it's not that. Mm. it's menopausal symptoms and actually training helps with that doesn't it definitely but I think that we have we've got this like real cycle and um it, it sort of society is fed into it that women are quite vulnerable and need to be protected at key times of you know pregnancy postnatally mm. and menopause you know you're kind of if you google that you're going to dry up and die you know it's like <laughs> dire and um you've outstayed your welcome <laughs> you've outstayed your welcome <laughs> But I, I see it a lot with the women that I work with. They kind of, some of the menopausal symptoms, you know, gaining weight around your middle um, and therefore your, your risk of stress incontinence goes up and then you're less likely to move and then you're losing your bone and your muscle mass and your risk of, of osteoporosis goes up and you can get caught in this really vicious cycle. And then your movement bubble just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And then you get end up with those special classes for like mm. over 60s. And actually, we don't need special classes. We just need to really understand what training we need and what it can do for us. So we've got, I think we just need to understand the barriers that people find to training and understand them so then we can give them a way forward. Mm. You know, you know, especially, you know, like I talk about pelvic health all the time, so it's totally in my bubble, but, you know, just stress incontinence. Half of all women will suffer with stress incontinence and men do too, but obviously women talk about it a little bit more and that stops people moving because they don't want to leak in public or they just stop doing all the things that would actually be really beneficial for them because no one 
and there's no education or understanding about it. Mm. So, so that's a real challenge. A quick one on that. You just said half of all women, so that's obviously a lot. Yeah. Um, and is that over a certain age, half of uh, half of all women over. 40? What? Sorry, one in two women who give birth. Sorry, one in two oh, women. Who right. Give birth okay. Will suffer with stress incontinence. I don't actually know the figures for women who don't have children, but it costs the NHS some, I can't remember the figure now, billions, you know, billions. Yeah. And actually we've got, we've got so many preventative measures and responsive measures we can put in place. But again, the dots don't always get joined up. And But th- this is where, this is where it can, it can then be self-fulfilling, like what you just said about mm-hmm. getting osteoporosis and blah, blah, and all of this sort of stuff. It can be self-fulfilling, can't it? Because then women can then say, well, I can't I, I, I can't walk down the street without this happening, so mm-hmm. therefore lifting weights is just not going to happen. And then you get some, you get lots of stories about women joining gyms or joining, um, or, uh, you know, joining exercise programs and go, I'll just stand at the back because I leak. So therefore I'll do it over there, um, you know, and then nobody sees it and what have you. But that's okay because that's perfectly normal. Yeah, that, and that's a really good word, Pete. You just that, that's there. not true, though, is it? It's not normal. No, <laughs> it's not. It's really common. So yeah, common, but not normal. But we've got this kind of historic thing, and I hear stories all like every day of women that go to their healthcare professionals and they ask questions about what's happening to them, and they get fobbed off with things like, "Well, you had a baby, what do you expect?" or "Well, you're menopausal." <laughs> or you know just I, I'm writing a book it's called the shit my gynae said because I'm sure there's very there's some great gynecologists out there but the things that come out of healthcare professionals mouths about women's pelvic health like it is laughable but it's shocking at the same time so yeah women just go oh well that's I'll just have to put up with that then and, and we have and for decades you know women were never never ever talked about vaginas and pelvic health ever and so we've still got decades and decades of women who aren't talking about this stuff. Yeah, actually it's happening to so many of us and is a huge reason why women aren't moving and then aren't loading their bones and their muscles and all the, all the good stuff. And then are getting horrendous chronic illnesses and diseases and mm. living really long but unhealthy lives. Are you seeing well, things, things? Sorry, I was just like, are you seeing things? change i mean what i was going to say i remember i've been doing this for 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 close to 25 years now and when i started like you said there used to be these over 50s classes yeah quite common um and nowadays i think maybe it's because we get i'm getting older as well but you think 50 is not old now it's not old you know but there used to be these over 50s classes which were really and because i started you know in my in my uh you know about 20 years old you know, for me then 30 years to 50 is a long way off. And you had these over 50s classes that were really kind of scaled back. They were really tame. They were really, like you say, wrapping people in cotton wool and being very, very careful, you know, mm-hmm. bubble wrapping people and giving them really simple, uh, you know, certainly not not heavy exercises to do. Mm-hmm. And nowadays, um, I train lots of people, lots of people and women in their 50s and 60s. And like I said, Edith seems to be getting stronger mm-hmm. every year. Um, but it, is it changing? You know, I mean, it, it, there, there, I know there's lots of stuff on TV now and there's more awareness and there seems to be a kind of a, a drive for more awareness, especially around women and training and health and fitness and strength and, and everything else. Is Are we slowly changing and getting better? Yes, I would say yes, to put a positive spin on it. I mean, we're long gone are the days of, you know, um, Cindy Crawford videos and leotards and women just doing cardio for hours on end I think we are moving away from that but there's still a lot of fear around weight training you know like women you know if you go into a mainstream gym you tend to get sweaty men grunting in the weight section whatever globo gym you go to that that's still a thing and women can still feel quite uncomfortable. And you get a lot of mansplaining, men telling women that they're doing things wrong. And, you know, that still happens all the time. So I think, you know, like your space, like a, like a really open, welcoming space where it's totally normal that men and women are all just weight training together. 
I think we are getting there and there's lots of brilliant women's only spaces, which is fantastic too. But I really hope we get to a point where we don't actually have to have separate spaces to make it happen. But I think we've got a lot of um, sort of societal stories around women doing strength training. You know, so many women say to me, oh, I don't want to do that because I don't want to get bulky. And I'm like, oh my God, I wish we had enough testosterone to get bulky. <laughs> desperately trying to cling on to our muscle mass here i'd love some testosterone please but i want some of what they have i want some of it you know they, <laughs> what? They, um, they still that's still like stories in women's head like it's it's or well, they you know like older women have told like sweating is um it's not it's not a nice thing for women to do and stuff like that like what so what what would you say this is this is huge this is huge because i've, I've not always been in the fitness industry right so i didn't know anything about this stuff and then now it's obvious to me that if women lift weights in a certain way they're not going to get bulky and it's going to be really good for them and yeah. i'm not bashing cardio um but there's a lady who used to come to me who loves her cardio right she goes running yeah. she goes swimming she does loads and then she started and then it, her husband was actually coming to, to see me and he said she's read somewhere in the paper that lifting weights is good for your your bones and that when you're when you're a menopausal lady or beyond menopause. And I was like, well, yes, it is. I can't explain all the things behind it, but yes, I know that it is as long as she feels okay doing it. So she came along, started doing it. COVID happened. We went online, did all of that. Then as soon as COVID finished, and the leisure centres opened up again, she said, oh, "I'm leaving because I'm going to go back to doing." swimming and and even though she was do she wasn't doing that she was lifting weights beforehand with mm. me anyway um and she was gone back to doing like loads of cardio and it's how can I, it concerns me not necessarily just her but like like for everybody it concerns me because like you say osteoporosis stuff like that and cardio kind of and i'm not bashing it but it doesn't do any it doesn't do any favors for that does it it doesn't actually keep yeah. your bones strong and it doesn't keep lean muscle and all of that stuff that keeps well, us you going. lose it yeah especially so how swimming, especially is swimming this, is, where you're not even bearing any you know you're all your weight is taken i mean swimming is swimming is the most popular leisure activity in in england you know is it? Uh, for the number yeah the number of people who do it because it is so accessible and because it is so gentle and because i think yeah. it is seen as a it's not bad for your joints, you know, it's very, you know, well, it's, it's endurance, very, isn't it? Yeah. Endurance also, means efficiency. Efficiency yes. means less, less stress rather than more yeah. stress, doesn't it? But Which also you're not, not even, you're not even bearing any of your own weight in, in a swimming pool. So yeah, from a, from a bone health perspective, it's, it's, yeah, it's certainly not going to be ticking those boxes. No. Yeah. But so, so I was I like, I mean, I'm like I said, that's just a matter it's, it, it is a huge concern of mine. I just, it's, 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 and I don't necessarily train a lot of women or, or, or like really, but it's, it's, I hear it all the time. So how, how do we get beyond that? I mean, obviously you're doing what you yeah. do to help get beyond that. And you go around talking to people in gyms and workshops and, mm. and all of that sort of stuff. But you know, how, where, where can women find this information? I mean, we, even the NHS websites, it is, like it's moving forward. There's some, there's a little bit of guidance now. So for and like uh, campaigns like Girls Gone Strong, fantastic. They're doing absolutely brilliant work. But I think we have to look at um, where exercise fits in like a you know like a pyramid of wellness. Mm -hmm. And if we look at say like the the average midlife woman, right? She's going to perimenopause. The perimenopause is six to ten years before actual the day of menopause. So we're talking anything from forty plus. And we've got hormones changing all the time and they're doing tons of cardio and eating nothing but dust. They're putting on weight around their middle and they don't understand why. And we know, right, exercise is a source of stress if we're not recovering well from it. So they're, they're already leading really busy lives, running from one thing to the next, meetings, kids. They're taking care of parents. They're taking care of kids. They've got loads of shit on their plate their cortisol levels are really high. Then they go and do an hour of cardio every day because they feel that's what they should be doing. Their cortisol is even higher Then their weight goes up and they kind of get just stuck in this really crappy cycle. And we need to like look at a woman as a whole and be like, right, we need to rein all of that in. But that's really hard because they do that for their mental health and just reframe what exercise can do for them because for so long exercise has been used, especially for women, to make women smaller or skinnier 
and all of that stuff. And actually we've got, we're still trying to unravel that and be like, what can exercise and training do for your body to make you feel good and be healthy and use it in a completely different way? So I think we've got a lot of work to do there about reframing what exercise is for. And one, I suppose one of the challenges is that in an industry which has multiple bags of solutions, mm. I mean, the one thing that, you, that we have as trainers and, and most exercise professionals, we, most of them know what we're doing. And mm. so in response to someone's um, need, our first call is to go and put our hand into the bag of solutions. Mm-hmm. You know, essentially, we could sit there and say, okay, you're going through menopause, or you've just had a child, etc. Mm. you know, I hear you, here's my solution. That's the first thing. And, mm. and the NHS is full of solutions, but it's not necessarily, you know, we had Adam Meekins on last week, a physio, he's mm. full of solutions, mm. because that's his job. Someone mm. sits in front of him saying, I've got a shoulder problem, he can provide a solution. But what is it that's going to take someone from this dealing with pain dealing with the situation they're in and and just being you know i i i had someone sit in front of me yesterday they didn't sign up for a variety of reasons probably didn't give them the certainty they needed and didn't convince them but they're in chronic pain in their upper back they were told that they need to do strength training but for whatever reason there's not enough of a need or there's not enough confidence to do it. So people are quite happy to put up with stuff. What, what are you seeing that's taking someone from a person who needs to do something, mm. who understands intellectually and yeah. is living in discomfort to suddenly saying, actually, I can do something about this and I want to, and I do believe it's going to be fixed rather than just seeing it as another solution that someone's putting in front of them. Mm. I think there's two things there. I think we've got, a little bit like all of us have to deal with this like giving someone what they want versus what they need like this law you know I'm a relative newbie to the health and fitness industry but even when I was a probation officer it was a little bit the same and I think finding that balance between promising somebody or try saying you're going to deliver what they want to hear at the same time as actually giving them what you think they need and then like finding that relationship so you can slowly switch the balance I think is one part of it but also I think we a little bit in a society where we just go to people for solutions like the lack of responsibility we take for our own health and I think COVID was a really perfect example of this is that you know not to get into the big COVID debate but you know there's so many things we could simple things we can do for ourselves but we don't do and it's, it's much harder to take action on those things. It's much easier to go to your GP and say, I'd like some drugs for this, please, for this chronic pain. Because actually, it's really hard for me to change my stress, sort out my sleep and my nutrition and what I put in my mouth. It, I think we've got, I think that's a really big question. And I, I think it's all about relationship building to get somebody to the point to understand what the point of exercise is and why they might want to sign up to do that. Um, but also I think fear, the unknown. I still think there's tons of education to do around exercise and movement. It's, right. it's That's huge, a very short it? answer to a big question. Yeah, it's huge, isn't it? Because I mean, I'm I'm doing a thing at the minute and I'm looking at like influences mm. on on people and and you know, and you get like the, the you get kind of cultural, familial, social, experiential, all these influences, and everyone thinks like they know what to do because the influence the, the influence we have in our culture is right. Something hurts, you go and see the doctor, mm. or you go to the physio, or whatever. Um, you have kids, therefore your your pelvic floor is not going to be very strong after that. Um, mm. And it's it's all there, isn't it? So it, it, this is the thing, and it comes at you from every angle because it's permeated through our culture. Because yeah. since you know since the dawn of time, men have lifted weights. Women have looked after the kids mm-hmm. and that's been the way it is. And then you have to molly coddle the women and yeah. then it, it it comes through like that. And it's, it's actually changing, isn't it? But it takes so mm-hmm. long. Mm-hmm. But when, when you've got um, easy fixes as well. So the, even, even now social media influence of just do this, here's your solution, do this. I talk about it all the time about, you know, eat, eat less and move more. It's mm-hmm. super simple, isn't it? Mm-hmm. How easy is that? Mm. But we've still got like you know we've still doubled obesity over the last thirty years. It's it's really bonkers, and that again this concerns me, and it never used to because I was part of it. 
Mm. Um, you know, so it's I don't know where I'm going with that. I just I just <laughs> it, it hit me, but no, but it's it's the cult it's the cultural aspect. So yeah. how do we how do we change that? I mean, um, you know, like the NHS is massive, mm. and you know, it's it's one of those things. The people within the NHS are doing everything they can mm. to help people. Mm. So how do you get above that and get like you know government or whatever to change the message? And it's not necessarily government, isn't it? But you've got to change the message above that so then it can permeate into the mm. into the NHS, and then people like you mm. can then be referred out to, right? Mm. But this is a bit. I have a bit of a thing about this. Like the women I work with, I'm working with such a small, tiny proportion of women that can afford my service. Ex yes, and that you know that doesn't sit very easily with me because there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of women that don't know this stuff, and so. We, you know, like last year we had the women's health strategy that was released. I mean, the fact that we finally got a women's health strategy is quite exciting and that they've just developed, you know, a model for doctors to learn on, a female model for the first time ever. That was only last year or the year before. Like they don't have any female anatomy training. So, you know, there's some GPs and they've never had any female specific training. So, you know, we've got sorry there is a long-winded point to this with like the women's health strategy like half of that strategy is about education and about preventative and educating women's obviously specifically before we get to this like reactive thing all the time and I think we've got to do that like the obese what is our obesity strategy I don't even know what it is but it's it's so like reactive all the time it's we could and this is why I do like loads of workshops and webinars because I just if we can share you know, and we're probably just a really small percentage of people that really love exercise. So we're a bit maybe unique, but if we can share that education about why, then maybe people will be more willing to give it a try. I think I you saw, know. you saw, you mentioned, I don't, mean, I don't want to keep going back to COVID and stuff, but you may, we mentioned it earlier, but you see that when the government really wants to throw its all behind something, how much funding and how much money they can come up with very quickly and and produce a very clear whether you think it was the right message or not is, is something that we're not going to even touch with a barge pole on here but, yeah, um, yeah let's, have, let's have a chat about that shall we? <laughs> you know, how they how they could come across with you know uh you know what was it uh you know wear your face mask stay at home protect the mm. nhs you know mm. what i mean bang and that was literally broadcast like every day all day for like six months you know and when they actually, when they really decide to throw something behind something, you know, they can do it. And in terms of, like you say, the more proactive message, mm. I know it sort of comes down to pharma and money and all the rest of it, mm. but the, the, the more the more proactive message of people taking more personal responsibility for their own um, life and health, mm. and that would massively reduce the burden on the NHS mm. if we can ever get that to happen i mean um, imagine it walk walk daily eat broccoli sleep sleep yeah drink water like, walk sleep yeah <laughs> any of the any three of the really simple things to do that got hammered home subliminally like 24 hours a day for six months yeah. like all the other stuff we'd be we able to slot it in to this <laughs> podcast every episode <laughs> couldn't we <laughs> Couldn't it's um, it's, well, it's funny though because Vicky said yeah. something there earlier as well about money, mm. and that really hit me as well because you know we got we got to make a living out mm. of what we do right, and people see it as a as a um what do you call it? a luxury right, <laughs> and then everything's tight at the minute because everything's expensive and and all of that, so that that then goes by the wayside, um. And it, it doesn't sit with well with me charging the guys. Well, it does, but I could, I'd could i love to do it for cheaper and have more people and be able to make more of an impact than just on the people who are trained. And you were saying about the amount of money that is spent in the NHS just dealing with the problems and not actually creating a solution. And I think there was a stat about... Um, type two diabetes is the same, just treating type two diabetes is massive. Mm. Um, and there's, and that's not even the research that, that doesn't include research going into actually doing something about it. Mm. Um, and it's this, it, you know, it's, it's the same for this, the same for menopause, the same for everything. So all of that money is there. 
it's just being thrown at, like thrown at the problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is one of the things that, like, I don't know, just th- like thinking big is how do you flip that and get get that money to be able to go towards the solution? Not, mm-hmm. not the, not, it's kind of like a band-aid or whatever. Just keep putting that on it, isn't it? And spending money on those things. And then it's, that, that's that's been sitting in my head for a while now. Mm-hmm. Um, but how do you become the person who does that, though? That's the thing. <laughs> you've got to start somewhere, haven't you? you start somewhere. This is why you're doing the right thing, because I don't know off the top of my head anyone who anyone else who, who does what you do. There aren't many, to be yeah. fair. There aren't that, well, I mean, there are people, but there's not that many people that do it. And there's, I don't know, how many women in the UK that, We'll have just, yeah, just going back to the Helen Hall episode, which was all about menopause, and she said, didn't she, that she actually she 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 spent money to go to like a private mm. menopause expert clinic um, to be dealt with, you know, and and got a really good service and got some really mm. good advice. But the advice she'd just been given, you know, by the standard kind of doctor that she was at, wasn't so. So again, it's that kind of money mm. kind of is that barrier to to service yeah. isn't it and you know the more yeah. money you've got then the, the higher level of experts you can you can it's be seen well. by and the, the higher level of information you can get and and all the rest of it um do you think that crossfit I mean, you mentioned crossfit earlier i think crossfit has actually done it's it, you know some people bash it and but mm-hmm. i think it's done a number of really good things and one of the things i think it's done is actually it's really popularized strength training yeah. for women hasn't it you know and, and that different female aesthetic of you know, mm. looking strong rather than, like you say, just exercising to look skinny. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, we, you know, CrossFit does get bashed and I loved CrossFit and I love the community that came with it and which I think is actually really important, especially for women. They, you know, they work well in communities and having the, the chance to talk to other women and then seeing other women who are doing that, like it's a little bit out there for lots of women to go and li- shove a, you know, lift a barbell above your head. And then they, then they go to this place and there's loads of women doing that. So I think CrossFit has done amazing things um, in that respect. And, you know, it's, it is a bit of a cult once you're in, um, <laughs> but in a, in, a, in a good way, it is a community. And I think that's a really important part of exercise for many people, right? When I, I couldn't go to cross well I could go but I didn't really know what I was doing and I didn't nothing felt very good I felt like someone had cut my right arm off because I also lost all those people too and you know I literally then had nowhere to go so then I just stopped moving because I was I was scared to move I didn't have anyone to train with I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't have a community anymore so then that I was just just for ages just wallowed around doing nothing which is horrendous it, that's common, isn't it? I mean, the difficulty I have is that often if, I'm lo- if I lose someone as a, as a member, so say they do an introductory program with me, uh, not everyone continues to become an, on- an ongoing member. And at the back of my head, I'm always thinking, you know, I, I know you don't necessarily need me to succeed. Mm. It's not that I am the only reason you would succeed, but my fear is that people will just go back into that groove Mm. and they and it it takes a long time doesn't it to Mm -hmm. to to cross the new groove and you're you know you can see why people failed in crossfit as i mean sorry during covid is because Mm. they didn't have those communities those 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 kind of accountability groups and and Mm. and the motivation external motivation could be a big factor Mm. so my fear is is that as soon as someone stops working even if they've only been with me say two two months three months that they that I could have a phone call with them in six months and they've done nothing in between. Exactly. I mean, how are you talking to your clients about that length of journey and the fact of what it actually mm-hmm. takes to make this a permanent lifestyle change, whether with you or, or not with you? Yeah, you know? I talk, I'm really honest with people that I work with and just say, if you want a personal trainer who's going to beast you and make you skinny, I am not, I'm not your girl. And this, you know, I view, say, postnatal recovery, that's a two-year process. Not that you're going to feel mm. crap for two years, but, you know, it takes two years for your fascia and your connective tissue to, to re, you know, to become stronger. And, you know, it's a, it's a big thing. So I kind of, I think I just reframe what's happened to their body and give them permission that you're not 
no one's bouncing back after six weeks from birthing a human. Like that's not a thing. It's a thing on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, it's it a scary it? commitment. It happen on Instagram. <laughs> scary commitment. And I just say to people like, let's start at the beginning. We'll start with, with eight weeks and then you can do whatever you want after that. But give it eight weeks because, you know, not, yeah. not even in eight weeks, nothing changes. But we've got to be committed to a pro- This is a process. This isn't a dip mm. in dip out thing. And so actually most of my clients that I have now, I've had four years, but my whole, like my whole business is kind of set up as they come in as one-to-one where they probably do need me. And now then we sort of move through a process and I run a studio and that's like four to one. Those women don't need me. They understand their bodies enough. I just provide a structure for that to happen in a community, mm. but they know their body. So I know that even when they leave, they understand their body, they understand their movement, they understand their challenges, they understand what they're really good at, and they can take that anywhere and they can do anything with that. So that's like my my best hope for people when I start with them. But I'm really honest yeah. that this is not a quick process. Like It isn't, because the many people have spent many years, I mean, yeah. on the opposite side, like I, I don't specialise in the area you do, but mm. but a lot of these things have taken a while to get to the point where they need to be fixed or they're at acute enough phase. So whether it's through an acute injury or whether or not it's from lifestyle changes that have accumulated over 10, 15, 20 years, you can make a fast, you can make fast progress. You're talking about making massive changes to someone's body in a year, which isn't actually a long time. No. And it, you know, but, but it does, you know, it's not going to happen overnight, is it? It, It is. And it's getting in that mindset because you're, you're kind of having to counteract the typical marketing bombardment, which is, and particularly as we come up to January, you're going to get yourself ripped in this time frame, And that is difficult to, to balance. I mean, look, I'm guilty of it to a degree. I run 12 week programs or six week programs, mm-hmm. but I kind of know my audience that yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what's going to grab them, you yeah. know? Yeah. And I've got to educate later, I suppose. Yeah, and like we said, it's about that balance, right? It's like giving them what they need and what they want. So if you get them in on the on the on the twelve week shred, but then you start educating them, then they're going to stay with you for a lot longer. And they're not just going to do the twelve week turnaround. Mm. But yeah, it is, is it, I think a really difficult one. Is that is that is that listen first, educate later, isn't it? Yeah. Is there any How, advice, Vicky? Sorry, Vicky, uh, for. I'd, I'd say probably we're speaking mainly on here to, to, to women over 35, over 40. Yeah. Um, mm. What if you were to give just, um, you know, two, three, four, you know, like we said, the kind of, you know, stay mm. at home, wear your mask, protect the NHS or eat broccoli, walk and, <laughs> sleep, you know, um, yeah. but, but specifically some, some, some real almost universal advice that's yeah. good for women with their, health and their strength and then their longevity moving forwards um what do you think are kind of not you you used the term non-negotiable earlier yeah what would you say are your kind of not obviously there's exceptions but we're talking sort of general um mm-hmm. what what are your non-negotiables and what do you think are the real principles really that women should should use say 40 onwards in terms of their health and training uh, number one is always my first line of defense is lift heavy shit <clears throat> that would be number one that's an easy one um number what two do you mean by that just i'm just thinking for the listeners what, what okay you, so yeah lift weight enough to get a response from your body so we have swathes of beautiful pink one kilo dumbbells in argos in sports shops and everything that is one two or three kilos comes in a pink or a purple and it drives me nuts Right. <laughs> women's handbags weigh more than five kilos so i don't know what these one kilo two kilo weights are for but they're always pink or purple i find it really offensive and i you know I just redid my website and i was trying to look for images of women weightlifting oh dear god is <laughs> women with one kilo dumbbell with some amazing hot fitness pt behind a male one helping her with her one kilo dumbbell all right oh right okay so lift <laughs> learning to lift find someone that can help you whether that's in a mainstream gym or you know one of us to lift heavy enough that you feel like you want to put that weight down don't be fearful of giving yourself an injury from lifting because you will become much more injured if you don't increase your muscle mass and your bone mass so 
lift heavy shit. So whatever, I mean, maybe one kilo is heavy for you, not to dismiss one kilo. Maybe that is enough for that person at that time. But, you know, we, I see it. As soon as you're ready to move on to two kilos. Move, move, move on, two. move on to two, yes. you know. <laughs> yeah. And like, don't stay stagnant. I think this is, women are really good at this. They get a plan. It fits in their lifestyle. They're like, I can do that. I know exactly what I'm doing. And they do the same thing over mm. and over again for months on end. So lift heavy shit, make sure you add some progression in. So even if you your thing is walking, cool, that's fine. Whatever brings you joy, find something that brings you joy, but up it or make it a little bit harder or, you know, you know all the, all the rules of progression, but don't stay stagnant. I think probably be number two. Mm. Number three is, is a really hard one, but really take a look at what's on your plate. Because if you are highly stressed, running around, like rushing women, there's a whole book called Rushing Women Syndrome, brilliant book. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're thriving off of stress, but we're not going to achieve anything we want to achieve if our cortisol levels are through the roof and our hormone, our set of female sex hormones are all over the shop. And then we're like run, it's like just slamming into perimenopause, completely burnt out. So like take an honest look at this is really hard at what's on your plate. What can you get rid of? We're like a little bit of control freaks. Just get rid of, there's so many things we don't have to do that we think we need to do. So that kind of comes under like manage your stress, which I know is really hard, but is there anything you could honestly take off your plate? Um, how many do you oh, want? So, sorry, I thought you were, yeah, because when you said look at what's on your plate, I thought you were talking about... Oh, no, you... sorry, like your... Um, yeah, and your then you were talking plate. about yeah. cortisol. I thought you were talking about food, but you actually mean tasks and... and... Yeah, tasks, sorry, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Right. yeah. Like, sometimes I literally get, I get a paper plate and I get women to write down all the things they're responsible for in a day. And I'm like, I'm not going to... You can't add exercise on top of that. Something else has got to go, because otherwise mm. exercise is just another thing you've got to do on your to-do list. So I've, I've, thing you're get rid of. I've, I've got a great thing I've been doing with um, some guy. I've got a, a new program I'm doing, which is more of a mindset side of it. And it's with exactly that. Mm. And we use what we call charge points throughout the day. So, you know, if your phone's running out of battery, you charge mm -hmm. it up, don't mm -hmm. you? But if you're running out of battery, you don't. You carry on. Mm -hmm. it's, it'd, be like you'd be it'd be like continuing to try and use your phone when it's about to die. And you're like, no, 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 no. It's fine. I'll just turn this off and turn this off. I'll turn the data off. I'll turn this off. It'll go for another hour now. So Love yeah, that. but you're not going to be able to do anything with it, are you? It turns into an, an old phone, doesn't it? Like one of them old Nokia's. Nokia. <laughs> or you plug it in, right? And then it charges it up. So I talk to that. I, I use that concept with the guys um, in this mindset program. And it's like basically find things throughout your day that give you joy. So mine's walking the dog, right? But I get time to do that. Mm. I say that's mine. That's one of mine. Doing this is one of mine. Mm. I enjoy doing this. Mm. Training the guys outside is one of mine. Mm. Um, you know, the, the calls that we do on online as well for the for this program is one of mine. And they, these so I've kind of put them in um slotted them into my life and it actually gives me energy. Yeah. Um so and, and one of the guys was saying on that that he kind of thought he was doing that, right? He wants to lose weight, he thought he was doing it, he'd work for a couple of hours. And then he'd give himself a reward, which was usually going down the kitchen and eating something <laughs> that he didn't want or need. And he's like, he goes, he made the realization on the call. He didn't even know he was doing this. He didn't really recognize it. And he made the realization on the call that he was, he was rewarding himself with kind of self-sabotaging behavior for something he'd done saying, I've done a good thing. So I was like, well, if you change that with, he plays the ukulele, play the ukulele for 20 minutes instead mm -hmm. Take, he's got a dog, take the dog for a walk and all that. And then it's, and then he's doing the moving more and eating less thing, mm -hmm. but without being told to do that, without with, by having that, and not even having a strategy around it, just being like, that is one of the things that brings me joy throughout the day. And then you can have wins at the end of the day and all of that. So, and this is a way, because you said, you know, you've got to take things away from that plate. Mm -hmm. And it's actually being able to, replace things that are kind of self-sabotaging behavior with something that makes you feel good. And then you want to do more of it. So yeah. actually you get more time throughout your day. Um, and I just, I just, I just think, yeah, that, that really hits home because people struggle with that because they think they need to add more in. And it's like, you need to think about what you're adding in though, because it's I more love stress. That analogy with the, the mobile phone. It's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. 
So, so, so Vicky, we've got the straight, we've got the, we got the lift heavy shit. Yeah. We've got the take things off of your plate. Yeah. And we've got the make, we'll lift heavy shit and make sure you've got some element of kind of progression or, you yeah. know, you're constantly trying to improve and move forwards. You're not being stagnant. Yeah. And taking stuff off of your plate. Yeah. I have one more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, as a woman, um, if you feel there is something wrong with your body or it's not going right, especially in relation to your pelvic health, don't literally sit on it for 10 years thinking that, oh, well, I'm a woman, what do you expect? Or any of those things, because there is so much that we can do about it. And if you go to your GP and you get fobbed off, find someone else or go to a different GP. And I say, just don't put up with stuff like, you know, your body. And, you know, I literally spoke to someone yesterday who got I questioned her doctor about whether she should be on this medication. And he said to her, well, what do you know better than me then? So what I, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what I'd say is just like, learn as much as you can about your body and use it as because it, knowledge really is power but use it when things are going brilliantly great but when they're not you need that knowledge about your body say this is not okay for me and take and to get help get some help with that you can't solve everything yourself but to get some help with it there's so many things that are literally ruining women's lives especially in relation to public health um they're, they're not going out they're not seeing people they're, they're literally stopping their lives and there's so much that we can do it's just finding the right person to help you. So don't literally don't sit on shit. <laughs> I think what we'll have to do, Vicky, we'll have to start to wrap up in a minute, but it'd be yeah. great to get you back on and maybe talk to, you know, maybe talk about perimenopause, you know, do it, do uh, maybe an episode specifically about an area sure. you know, or a stage of life, you know, and we can delve sure. more deeply into that, but this has been a really good kind of overview. So what is it that you, um, so, so first of all, that the, the real strong women, Yes. How did you come up with, with, with that name and what does that kind of mean to you? And what is, you know, what's the ethos behind it? So, I mean, my original business was called Strong Mama because I was working with postnatal mums and I was like, actually, it's not. It's just about real everyday women. And I, I kind of social media helped me with this one because, um, you know, women aren't supposed to be strong. I kind of wanted to go against the grain a little bit. So, I mean, essentially, I just labeled it after the people I work with real strong women they're strong in so many ways and if they if they they and they come to me to get stronger physically but obviously it's completely interlinked with your mental health so it just kind of it says what it does on the tin and that's honestly just kind of how it came about um and like on my first website I had I just literally had pictures of all my clients all tiny little squares I just asked them to send me a picture of them so the first thing you saw on my website was real women just real women not Instagram women not ones that have done all their makeup and got their lighting right just real women that are doing exercise and they're all sizes or you know like just women of every every different type and that's that's what women look like that's what that's what we're you know we just want to be strong to to live our life and that's kind of as simple as it is Excellent. Well, what we'll do, we'll, uh, and we'll obviously, uh, I'll talk to you as well about getting you down to uh, Unique Results in Chelmsford to do one of your workshops as well um, mm. in the near future. Um, I know you do, I know you've got online programming. Uh, you've obviously got the studio in, is it yeah. High Wycombe? In High Wycombe, yeah. I've got a little High studio, Wickham. just a small um, space for women. Yeah. And you do, and you do your workshops and courses and yeah. things. What if people wanted to want to find out more about you, want to follow you, want to kind of look at what you do in more detail? What's the best um, way for them to do that? Is it through social media? Is it through your website? What's the best way for people to? Either kind of... if people just want to sort of see what I do, then probably social media. Um, but if people just want to have a chat, they they can just book in for like a free consult on my website. It's right at the top of my website. And I'm really happy just to talk anything through with anybody. I hate the thought of people being literally sat on things and worrying about them and not knowing what to do about it. Like there's no commitment. I just, I like talking to other women. So yeah, just feel free to book in to have a chat, like any, you know, calendars on there. So it's realstrongwomen.co.uk for the website. And yeah. is it real strong women on, on Instagram? On both Facebook well, yeah, and Insta Facebook yeah. And Instagram. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been it's been great. Uh, it's been great talking to you. Like, like I say, maybe this is just um, the start of something else. So we can get you on again to talk about a specific 
um, you know, phase of life and we can kind of delve more deeply into that would, would be would be great. Pete, before we wrap up, Joe, anything you'd like to uh like to say? Any comments or anything before we uh close? Yeah, I I definitely think doing like a little series of of episodes of like this stage of life, this stage of life, this stage of life is brilliant. I think mm. I think that would be fantastic because we've gone through so much there. Um and you can delve a lot deeper into it. And in in the in the um the tradition of thinking of something funny to say that I probably shouldn't, but I will anyway. No, if you, um, should, if you think you shouldn't, don't. <laughs> no, no, because no, no, it's a it's a Ross Noble thing, and he's from where I'm from, and he says if you think of something funny to say, you got to say it because it brings joy to the world, right? So Vicky mentioned mansplaining earlier. Now, for everyone out there, mansplaining is when a man tries to explain to you <laughs> what's going on. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> um, Mr. Paul Bassett, do you have anything you'd like to say in conclusion? I'm going to paint my 48 kilo kettlebell pink. <laughs> and I think I think when uh, when you do your next set of pistols, um, Peter, you should have the, you should paint yours pink as well. I don't think I've got enough paint. You know, uh, oh, you're showing off now. <laughs> that's it what's that called that what's that what do they call it when you're boasting but not a humble brag <laughs> asshole I, I, haven't got enough, I haven't got enough paint because the kettlebells are so big it's funny like you say though vicky i was again i've mentioned edith a lot on this podcast but we're getting this i've ordered a load of new kit and we've got this um the members wanted like a lighter barbell you know from the 20s just for doing certain overhead movements and things and and the bar we 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 got sent from um I think it's I think it's primal strength. It's a it's a so it's a 15 kilo bar instead of a 20 kilo bar, and it's pink. Yes. And it's called and it's called I think it's called Linda or something, the bar, because apparently it's named after like a, a CrossFit wad or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Terrible, but yeah. But I think yeah. all the wads are named after women, aren't they, or something? So it's called a Linda and it's a pink bar. So um yeah. yeah. It's not. <laughs> yeah, so because I don't want to, not... I don't want to diss the pink, right? Because all my barbells in my studio are fifteen kilos, and they're rainbow coloured, like yeah. shiny rainbow. And you know, I like pink things, but it's just the one kilo dumbbells that get me. <laughs> <laughs> they're more like dog chews, aren't they? Really, dog chews. <laughs> really, what they'd be better for? Yeah, do me. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Vicky. It's been an Thank absolute pleasure spending time with you. And we've got, in fact, I think, oh, it's probably a few weeks ago. I'm going to get myself confused. Tomorrow, which is a few weeks ago, we've got um, Donna Moore's podcast coming out, haven't we? Three times world's strongest woman who Amazing. just joined a gym just to to get fit um, and started doing body pump classes and ended up three times world's strongest woman. So um, yeah, that, that's that's fantastic. Um, but anyway, I've got my I've, I've got I've got into my time loop again where it's tomorrow, but it's three weeks ago. Um, anyway. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. If you've been on uh, YouTube, please do like, share, subscribe uh, to us. Um, if you want to join the Facebook group, just go on Facebook, search groups, Health Oddity, and one of the bouncers will let you into the group. Probably Pete is one of the bouncers, I think, um, will let you into the group. Uh, we will see you next week where we have... on. Is it might be Mike? It might be might be um, Mike Seuss. Uh, it, he might be the next one we're interviewing. I'm not sure. No. And then it's done. No, anyway, I shouldn't have. I shouldn't have gone down this rabbit hole. Okay, we will see you. What next a letdown. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Bye bye. Thank you. You've been listening to Health Odyssey with Peter Lant, Paul Bassett, and James Saint Pierre. To get your regular fix of hype free health, you can subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your favorite podcasts. You can find out more on today's and other topics at healthodyssey.com or find us on Facebook or Instagram by searching for Health Odyssey.